I want you to do something before you sit down, and it's really different what we're going to do, but I don't want you to just necessarily just join hands casually, but I want you to get this strong in your spirit right now, strong in your spirit. We're fighting a spiritual battle. You don't win spiritual battles with natural abilities and natural armament and natural intellect. You do this in the realm of the spirit. I, I wonder sometimes if all of us, maybe somewhat at least, have not failed in a, in a way to realize the incredible force and power that there is when you move into the realm or the sphere or the dimension of the Spirit of God. If you're praying for your husband, dear wife, never underestimate the impact of praying in the Holy Ghost in that situation. Speak life and faith into that circumstance. Speak power into that situation. Do not underestimate what intercession can do in our nation. Do not underestimate what anointed praying can do among the leaders of this country that they will turn their hearts toward God. That they will turn their hearts toward godly legislation that they will turn their hearts toward doing the right thing. I feel like praying for America right now. I want you to join hands now. Raise them when you join hands. Turn up that volume and pray in the Holy Ghost right now for this nation. Father, we're asking tonight for a breakthrough. A breakthrough, a breakthrough, a breakthrough. Oh, Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Well, thunder out an ovation to God. Just thunder out an ovation to God. Shout hallelujah. Glory to God. You may be seated. The Lord bless everybody tonight. You may be seated. I want to say something about tomorrow night's meeting. How many of you, this is not your church home, your visiting camp meeting, would you stand up all over the building? Well, that's about everybody, isn't it? I, mean, it's a, I should say it's a great number. Now, if you're planning to go home tomorrow, you don't want to do that. 
Because I want to tell you something. Tomorrow night, I feel led of God that we're going to have an incredible anointing service. And by that, when I say anointing service, I, I truly believe in my heart that I wish tomorrow night you had some way of getting your children here, your grandchildren here. I feel led of God tomorrow night that we're going to anoint everything in sight. I'm telling you... Uh, that this is going to be one of the most incredible breakthroughs when I preach on the anointing tomorrow night in this meeting. And uh, I'm going to anoint every child that you bring. I'm going to anoint all your grandkids. I don't care if it takes me till midnight. The devil's not going to get a one of your kids. He's not going to get you home. He's not going to get your family. He's not going to get your marriage. He's not going to get your house. He's not going to get any of them. I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to anoint them if they're five days old, get them here. I mean, we're going to anoint mamas that are carrying that baby. Say, well, that won't do any good. Well, I think it will. Amen. Bible said John the Baptist was full of the Holy Ghost in the womb of his mother. Amen. Glory to God. I'm believing that baby is going to be born going shakatara bahala bakasata. Glory! Hallelujah! Well, I'm ready. Are you ready? Yes. Now, everybody open your Bibles up to chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2. I'm going to get into something tonight that's just going to find out how spiritual this bunch is. Brother Summerall, now look, if they start throwing things, you come rescue me. Will you? And don't desert me. You're not one of these guys when they start throwing at me, you'll leave. Isn't he sweet? I just love him, don't you? I think the devil just has a migraine every day he gets up. I believe that every time Brother Summerall gets out of bed, the devil's saying, everybody get on your toes, he's up again. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I love Dr. Lester Summerall. What he means to our lives, uh, I don't have words to express it. What a man of God. What a wonderful ministry this is. What an incredible family this is. All the sons that are involved in the ministry of this great church tonight. What do you think tonight? <clears throat> well, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say that first. Let's just get started here for a minute, because I don't want to get you going at me yet. <clears throat> let me let me bless you a little bit before we get to Acts two. Can I do that? Can I just kind of throw a few things at you that'll just perk you up and make you feel just great? Turn to your neighbor and say, "I just feel great." I hope this guy just makes me feel great because I really like him a lot I like young Thompson a lot amen <laughs> do you realize what could happen tonight if every person in this building understood clearly what is involved in one mind and one accord now I have been on this I can't get off of this to the body of Christ I I'm not talking about some kind of unity to where it has absolutely no foundation when you put up a, a regenerate man next to an unregenerate man and call that unity I'm not talking about some unholy alliance that we that call ourselves children of the Most High God, that we are to align ourselves with anybody that's in the clergy that gets up and preaches the gospel, whatever gospel they want to call it. He doesn't say that I'm to align myself with that. I do not intend to walk under any ecumenical umbrella and say that I am in harmony with a man that does not believe in the blood of Jesus that a man that does not believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ, I do not stand shoulder to shoulder with a man that stands behind a pulpit and calls himself a preacher that does not declare it takes the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to be born again. I do not share that. I will never share that. And if that's the kind of unity they're talking about, they've got a problem, I will never, ever align myself with that. I am talking tonight about... The body of Christ coming to an understanding of what it is when we become unified. 
Now, I want to throw this phrase out again that I've thrown it out now for the last several weeks and I want this crowd to pick up on it. I want you to say this with me out loud. The whole, the whole is, greater is greater than the sum total, the sum total of, its of its parts. Let's say it again. The whole, the whole W H O L E. This is my wife right here on the front seat. Stand up, darling. Turn around. Smile at everybody. Amen. If I'd let her say something, but then I would never get the pulpit back. <laughs> the whole is greater than the sum total of its parts. Now, everybody understand this. If you have, say, two two-by-fours, boards, these boards separately can only hold a designated amount of weight. Would you agree to that? Just so much. But if you were to take these two boards and you were to fuse them together or put them together, they can hold many times more together than they can separate it. Now, if you were to take a bunch of wire and separate and put it apart, they can hold only so much stress on each strand of wire. Take that wire, put it together, and you form a cable. And they can hold many hundreds of times combined than they can separately. You can take many strands of thread, separate them by the thousands. They can only hold just a tiny bit of weight. Put them together, you can form a rope. They can hold a lot of weight. Now, you can take a bunch of raw recruits put them together, turn them over to Stormin Norman. And when he gets through with them, they won't be just a bunch of soldiers separated. They will be an incredible fighting unit. Then they become an army. You understand this? You can put a lot of people together and call them shareholders and form a company or a cooperation or corporation. And so what is created here is that what once was a bunch of separated individuals, when they are put together corporately, they form a third thing. Everybody say third thing. They form a third entity that is not formed until it is put together. Now... You have this bunch in Acts chapter 2 called the early church. In fact, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, everybody shout, fully come. They were all in one place and one accord. Now, it doesn't do any good for a bunch of us to come together as long as we're all concerned about our own agendas. And we have our own mindsets. And we're pretty resistant to flowing together. Because after all, that may violate my point of view. Lord, help us as right, brother. <laughs> you taking pictures? You want the preaching shot? Get ready. You ready? Get up if you want a good one. This can stand up. Here it is. You ready? One, two, three. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's silly. I know it. Now, <laughs> lady, quit reading the paper back there while I'm preaching. Put that paper down. There won't be any paper reading here while I'm preaching. She's reading her paper back there. I told her to put it down. That'll teach her, won't it? <laughs> she may leave and never come back. She's back there reading the New York Times, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> now, when you put... When you put these people together and they come together, the Bible said they were in one mind, one accord. Well, when that happens, something takes place. When you get into one mind and one accord, the next word hits in there. 
when they were all in one mind and one accord and the church then became fully come the Bible said and suddenly suddenly things happen when we get in one mind and one accord suddenly the power of God can intervene when we get in one mind and one accord suddenly miracles will begin to happen suddenly we will see breakthrough suddenly the powers of the devil are broken suddenly revival can come to the church suddenly we'll see an outpouring of the Holy Ghost but brother it cannot happen until the church gets into one mind and in one accord one mind one accord then suddenly we need a little of that suddenly thing happening again we've had this thing taken its time for a long time we need suddenly God moving upon the sea suddenly the powers of the devil are broken suddenly the captives are set free and it happens the moment the church gets into one mind and one accord my God somebody shout hallelujah <laughs> Then it said, suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all of the house where they were sitting. That's what happens when you get in one mind, one accord. It says there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire. That's what happens when you get in one mind, one accord. And I'm not talking about a little flick, your big flame, honey. I'm talking about a gigantic thermonuclear Holy Ghost explosion that absolutely was greater than anything that that world had ever seen. It not only happened in the fire, then they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now I want to hasten to say that... Uh, he didn't stop there. He didn't uh, start a denomination out of that. They didn't dam up the walls and board it up and say, let's start a denomination. Because you see, the criteria for being filled with the Holy Ghost was different then than it was now. Doctrinally, in some denominations, the evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost is speaking in other tongues. But the evidence for them receiving the Holy Ghost went farther than that. They didn't just get a tongue. When they got into one mind and one accord, and when they began to speak in other tongues, it was not the Mount Rushmore experience. It was not the apex. It was only the beginning. And my friend, if all we have, and all we ever have, and we think it is the ultimate experience, that all we ever do as proof of receiving the Holy Ghost is to speak in some kind of language that we call an other tongue, and there is no further manifestation of what that power is all about, we truly do not understand the impact of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Now, the reason that the Spirit of God was important was that it is the only way that you could get this bunch together. Because you can't do it in the natural. Brother, this is a pretty not obstinate bunch we've got here tonight. You people have your own mindsets, your own agendas, your own ideas. The way I ought to preach. How I ought to do it. One woman came to me one time. I got so happy in church. I was dancing. She said, you offended me tonight. I brought a guest with me. I've been offended. You offended me. Dancing. I said, honey, I wasn't doing it for you. <laughs> I was doing it for him. I was doing it for him. I wasn't dancing for you. I didn't have you in mind. I was dancing before the Lord. Somebody shout hallelujah. I am. <laughs> now, now when they begin to speak in other tongues, you see what happened was that that Holy Spirit brought them together. They became one. 
And when they walked in there, you had Simon Peter that was a fisherman, you had Luke that was a physician, you had Matthew that was a tax collector, go right on down the line, number them all out, the 120 that had their own personalities, but the very moment they got into sync, they formed another entity. My friend, they were no longer a bunch of separated, isolated believers with their own agenda. They now became the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And upon this 120 and the believers that would then follow, he would declare that upon this foundation or upon this church and upon this rock and upon this position, I will build my church and the very gates of hell will never succeed in coming against it. Now I want you to know tonight, whatever picture you have of the church is, I hope it is the proper picture. Because that early church in the next one and one half centuries would literally turn the known world upside down. They would absolutely evangelize and touch the whole world in less than two centuries. Do you know why? Because they were not separated. They became the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, it was so powerful that the time they got to Acts chapter 5, this man called Simon Peter that denied Christ. And Calvary would have such an anointing and such a power in his life, verses 12 to 16, that they would bring the sick and the afflicted and they would lay them in the streets in hopes that the very shadow of Peter would pass over them. And the Bible said in verse 16, they brought them out of hamlets and towns and communities and the word says, and every one of them were healed. I submit to you tonight that the day is going to come in this great church, Pastor Summerall, that they're going to be lined up out in the parking lots laying the sick and the afflicted and the very shadow of the believers walking in, they're going to rise and be healed in the name of Jesus. They're going to rise and be healed. Now, I want you to picture tonight this. I want you to picture this group being one. We have Baptists in this room. We have Methodists in this room. We have people from various parts of the state, country. We have everybody with their own personalities, their own ideas, and that's good. Their own points of view, that's good. He didn't want to make us out of cookie cutters and assembly line and we all look alike and talk alike and act alike. He put all that in you, all that creativity in you, all that fire in you, all that opinion in you. He's not trying to just, just to some way create you to be just like me or look like me or talk like me or think like me. He likes you like that. And that's what this is all about. That we then, through the Holy Spirit, have the ability to submerge our will into the bigger plan and the will of God. That we together of our own will and our own personal will say, Yes, Lord, I submit my will to the will of God. Whatever the Spirit is saying here, He's saying to me and I submit to that will. Well, then they became the powerful church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was so powerful and so strong that the Bible said that they had all things in common. It also said that this unity brought such, a, such a, a cooperation among them that they did not have one need among them. In fact, I'm going to tell you something that will kind of make you raise your eyebrow. The, the Word talks about that the, that the poorest day of your life would be the day that you became born again and you joined that early church because that would be the poorest day that you ever were. That's the day you came in. Because the moment you came in, the Bible said when you came into that church, that from that day forward, you would never ever go without your needs being met. No matter what you needed, they, they, they would supply that need. 
In fact, there was such an anointing, they would go out and sell some property, they would bring it in, and they would distribute everything that they had to one another, and then God would bless it and bring it back to those that gave it to them, to where they never ran out of anything. They had their needs met, their bodies were healed, their families were clothed, everything that they ever needed was being supplied by God, because they became a community of believers under the direction of the Holy Ghost. They had the power to raise the dead, heal the sick. Every need was met. They were the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, ooh, ooh, ooh. what happened to us I read something so astounding. Oh, it's going to get quiet here. Now watch this. Prove my point. 71% of people that go to church and call themselves Christians in the United States of America and are on the rolls of churches never give a dime to the work of God. 71%. Eighty percent of the needs of a church and a congregation is supplied by twenty percent of the congregation that goes to that church. That means eighty percent of any offering is given by twenty percent of the believers. Seventy-one percent of the people never give anything except some token response. Now, my question is, how long do you think that God is going to tolerate this? And how long do you think we truly can come to church as a body of believers under the household of faith that is supposed to be flowing in one mind and in one accord and truly expect the blessings of Deuteronomy 28 upon our congregations? It is no mystery to be solved. The implementation of the curse upon the body of Christ does not have anything to do with an unregenerate world. It is a deliberate action of disobedience that has brought the curse of God upon the body. I knew I shouldn't have done this. See, I knew, I knew it. I knew I, I knew I shouldn't have done this because I, I wrote this down when the Holy Spirit began to begin to give this into my spirit. It was so strong. And the Holy Spirit said to me so clearly today, what do you think is the most blatant sin that a Christian can commit? Because sooner or later, we're going to have to deal with this. Sooner or later, we are going to have to deal with this fact. We want blessing. We want God to save our children. We want God to bless our finances and give us great sums of money. We want His blessing upon our marriage. We want His blessing upon our life. We want His blessing upon our family. We want His blessing upon everything. We enjoy the feeling. We like to come to church. Oh, hallelujah. We like to be under this umbrella or this canopy of blessing. We like to sit in the house of God. Move over, darling. We like to sit in the house of God. And, oh, we just love to be blessed. And we just love that anointing. Oh, sister, did you feel that goosebump? Hallelujah. <laughs> we just, did you feel it, honey? Oh, yeah, you did too. Did you, honey? Are you interpreting? Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Tell her we're, we're glad she's here. <laughs> and we just love all of this wonderful blessing. And, and, uh, but, but, you know, then the time comes. When suddenly somebody says something about bring the tithe into the storehouse of the Lord. Huh? I work alone. You keep quiet. She's helping me. Now then she wants to start preaching. She said, and there's no anointing. It's gone. 
you get your own service. He invited me on this one. <laughs> and that's right. Then suddenly the anointing is gone. Oh, I liked it while ago. I liked it while ago. What is it? I know she does so now. Now then my wife's telling me what to do. I'm telling you, the women are taking over. They're taking over. Move over. I'm going to sit by you. I don't want to sit by a woman. Get over. I'm going to sit by a man. I'm telling you, brother, it's scary. They're taking over. Brother Summerall, the women are taking over. What's that? Hi, darling. Another woman. <laughs> now, but now, 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 please, please hear this. Something here is, is drastically wrong that we must face. I want his blessing. I want his provision. I want him to bless me. I come in here in this place and I want God's blessings upon my life. But the very moment we come to the part of the meeting that has to do with not something that can be voted on, talked about, or moved by my emotion. I want everybody to hear this preacher clear. Whether you ever like me or not, you will respect me because I am dealing with something that nobody wants to touch on. And it is this. Tithing is not something we vote on. It's not something we talk about. It's not something whether we feel like it or not. It is a command of God. It's a command. There isn't anything to vote on in here. If we are not tithing, we are in direct, blatant, disobedience to the command of God and it is affecting the whole body of Christ it's affecting us all it's holding the anointing it's withholding the corporate anointing it's withholding the miracles because God said I'm not going to tolerate people that rob me of my tithe and my offerings Now, I'm not the pastor. I'm the evangelist. I shouldn't be having to do this. But I want to tell you something. I'm going to tell you in just a moment what's going to make you really feel great about this. But I want you to hear me closely. Deuteronomy 28 talks about verse 2, And all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you if thou shalt hearken unto the commandment of the Lord thy God hearken unto the commandment verse 3 blessed shall you be in the city blessed shall you be in the field verse 4 blessed shall be the fruit of your body the fruit of your ground the fruit of your cattle the increase of your kind and the flocks of your sheep verse 5 blessed shall be your basket and your store Verse 6. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed are you going to be when you go out. Verse 7. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They'll come out against thee one way and they're going to have to flee from you seven ways. Verse 8. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. And he will bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Verse 11. The Lord shall what? Make thee plenteous in goods. Again, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, uh, in the fruit of thy ground and in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee verse 12 the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season and to bless all the work of thine hand everybody look at your hands and thou shalt lend unto many nations and shall not borrow are you listening to me tonight talk to me yeah. He said the blessing will be so great you won't have to be a borrower anymore. You'll be a lender. 
Then he said in the next verse, he said in verse 13, that the Lord will make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only, you shall not be beneath, if thou shalt hearken unto the commandment of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. If thou shalt hearken, if thou shalt hearken, not only hear it, if thou shalt hearken unto the commandment of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe I see it, I hear it, I hear it, I see it, I hearken unto it, and I do it. Now, I'm going to tell you something right there ought to be reason enough. Did you get it? Did you get that? He told me that if I would take and do what he told me to do. Now people, 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 precious people, get this, get this, get this, get this. Turn to your neighbor and say, get this. <sighs> Did you hear what I read? What will happen to the people that obey the command of the Lord thy You ready for this? I'm ready, Dwight. I'm ready, Dwight. And it only costs 10%. Amen. Did you get that? Just 10%. It's all it costs. If I made $500 a week, you mean to tell me that I had rather have my $500 with God's curse upon it? than $450 with His blessings. With His blessings. You mean I'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the field and my hands are blessed, my cows are blessed, my dog's blessed, my grandkids are blessed, everything I touch is blessed, the devourer's been rebuked, I'm blessed coming in, I'm blessed going out, and you mean it only costs me 50 bucks? You mean that's it? You mean to tell me, you mean to tell me that when it comes to my money, I believe my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Glory to God. I believe that I'm saved, that I'm born again. Oh, hallelujah. I believe I have the Holy Ghost. And I want all these blessings. Somebody come blow on me and knock me out. Just give me a blessing, 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 blessing. Yes, yes, yes. But don't you dare try to get from me my $50. I'm keeping that $50 and nobody's taking it away from me. I don't care what anybody says. No, no, no. And you mean to tell me that if I will do what God tells me to do, He says that all these blessings are going to come upon me and all it's going to take is 10% of what, gave, what God gave me in the first place. Now, now don't, please, dear God, don't get tight on me with this. Now, if that isn't reason enough, the command ought to be enough. Just a command. Right? Right, Brother Summer. The command is enough. You realize in our church memberships, you know what? You know what splits churches? You'll have membership cards in most churches. I was looking at one the other day. Now here was the criteria for joining that church. Do you smoke? Yes or no? If you say yes, you can't join that church. You taking pictures too, honey? Do you smoke? Well, you know, you can't. Now smoking, why wouldn't they let you join a church if you smoke? I didn't gonna send you to hell. Make you smell like you've been there. <laughs> it's... <laughs> and it's not, so don't act like it is. That isn't what sends people to hell. Well, do you drink? 
Yes or no? So if it's if it's yes, then you don't get to join the church. So they can come right on down the line. But it's not on there. Do you vow before God to obey the scripture in tithing? So then, absolutely not. I want all the blessing and I want all the benefits, but don't expect me to obey God here. And the fact of the matter is, when you get over to Malachi chapter 3, that the judgment and the curse is so severe, they say, when he said, will a man rob God? And that church looked at God and said, how have we robbed you? And he said, you've robbed me in your tithe and in your offerings. Okay, I want to stay on this 10% thing. I want to stay on that $50 thing. I want to stay here a minute. I want to show you the logic. Okay, Malachi verse, chapter 3, verse 10 then. Bring the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Now, and prove me now, herewith saith God. Here's God. Come on and prove me. I'm God. I call the whole world into existence. You can trust me with your 10%. That there may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith, saith God. And now watch this. Then he said, and just see if I will not open unto you the windows of heaven for 10%. $50. 20 bucks if you make 200 a week. Ten dollars if you make a hundred. Hundred dollars if you make a thousand. And for that ten percent that I commanded you to trust me, because this is the way I supply your needs, I will open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you're not going to have room enough to even be able to contain it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Do you mean to tell me that God <laughs> you mean that if I will obey God that He will pour out a blessing that I'm not even going to have the capacity to hold it. For 10%. Right. And if that wasn't enough, he said, and you know what else I'll do? The next verse he says, verse 11, I will rebuke that devourer, that thief that comes in there to take that out of there. I, I'm not only going to pour you out a blessing, you're not going to have room enough. To, how many in this room have still some room for God to bless you? Then he said, you're not even going to have to have room, so you have to call one of your relatives and say, my garage is full of the blessing of God. Can I borrow your garage? Then you'll have to go down to self-storage and say, I need 10 self-storage rooms. God's been so good to me. I don't have enough room. i got to go to the bank and get me some more vaults. i got to do this. The blessing of God. Then if that isn't enough, God said, then what I'm going to do is, I'm going to rebuke that one that comes in there and wants to try and steal it from you. I'll rebuke the, uh, the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit in the field before the in the field in the field before the time, saith the Lord. And all nations are going to call you blessed, for thou shalt be a delightsome lamb. He said, "I'm not only giving you a blessing; you can't you can't hold it. But I'm going to rebuke the devourer. I'll keep him away from your door. I'm going to push him back. All nations are going to call you blessed. You're going to have everything you'll ever need. Plus, you'll have a whole lot left over to give it to some." Somebody else and then of course the more you give it out it gets multiplied and it's coming back again and again and again and again wait wait everybody say wait all for 10 percent
Do you know that God will never advance you one step beyond your last act of disobedience? Your life is on hold. And it is a miracle that you're not eaten up. I'm going to tell you the truth with every kind of disease that there is. If you're robbing God, it's a miracle that judgment hasn't come. And if you don't believe that scripture, don't you dare get testy with me and uptight with me. I'm, I'm the shepherd. I'm just a paper boy. God has dealt with me about this, that this curse is coming off the body of Christ. We're going to see every need met in the body. We're going to get debt free. The church is going to... Brother Summerall, what keeps you from buying another plane is money. What keeps us from getting our churches built is money. What is it we're running around doing, worrying about paying off our mortgage, interest, 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 debt, debt, debt. That, that if the body of Christ would obey God, we would have everything we need to pay off our debts to get debt free to get our churches paid off to buy more planes for feed the hungry for everything that we will ever need it's here already if we would just obey God amen be a shout hallelujah Now, I want to tell you what the Spirit of God said to me so, so close. It is so strong in my spirit what He said to me. That if we don't start now in obeying God, we are going to lose everything. Because obedience brings God's greatest reward. What is the greatest thing you can do for God is obey Him. What is the worst thing you can do is disobey God. Blatant disobedience is the height of criminal activity toward God. Is to blatantly refuse to obey God. Because he said in Deuteronomy 28 after verse 13 that if you don't obey me, my God. He describes sicknesses, maladies, boils, every kind of physical description curse on your cattle curse on your family curse on your home curse on everything you touch curse is your whole life and speaking in tongues doesn't have anything to do with it yeah. you tell me how anybody can consistently I challenge anybody in this building or watching by television can prove that you're full of the Holy Ghost whether you speak in tongues or not, and you rob God of the commanded offering to God, how do you honestly believe that you're saved and born again and full of the Holy Ghost when you are blatantly disobeying God? I want to tell you what the I want to tell you what the full plan is. I'm doing all right. Is anybody sneaking up on me from behind? Watch him. Okay. He said, "I got you covered." You see how big he is? Don't mess with him. Now I'm going to carry this a step further. The Bible said in Joshua 7 that the sin of Achan brought a curse upon the whole nation. The Bible said in Malachi 3 that a whole nation can be cursed because of one act of disobedience. Ananias and Sapphira were not killed because God could not get along without that money when they lied about what they sold that property for. This was the way God met their needs. It was one accord. They flowed in one accord. Somebody had a need. you got to remember how fast that church grew. Peter preached that first message on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 men got saved. They only count men. Well, anytime you got 3,000 men, you got 3,000 women, honey. Women are always where the men are. Where the men are are the women. They're always there. Then you got 3,000 men. you got 3,000 women. you got a bunch of kids. <laughs> Don't you, Brother Summerall? It just worked that way. You remember. 
So now you got kids, you got kids, you got women, you got men, you got children. Now you got at least 9,000. Well, they all came to Christ. Now who's going to feed them? Who's going to take care of this early church? Who's going to take care of these followers? A little bit later on, 5,000 got saved. 5,000 men, 5,000 women, and a bunch of kids. Now you got 15,000 plus to 9,000. Now you're up to 25,000. Who's going to take care of him? Who's going to watch over him? Brother, you talk about one accord. They'd go out and sell a little property. They'd bring it in. They'd disperse it. And then you begin to read how that works when you get over into 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's the most incredible thing. And it says, and it says, He that gives little will get back little. And then he that gives a lot is going to get back a lot. Then read it in the Living Bible. It said, and then the joy was that when they would give it out, it would bless everybody that needed. God would bless it. It would come back to them. So everything they gave out in this portion would come back in gigantic portion. And then the people that received help, they would praise God for those that helped them. Then the ones that gave it out to be helped got more back than they had given out. And the little boy with the few loaves of fish, and the few loaves of bread and the two fish, when he got through giving his little offering to Jesus and they blessed it, the Bible said, oh, it's great. They fed 15,000, but everybody forgets to talk about he had his whole lunch in a sack. Then it took 12 men carrying 12 baskets, picking up the leftovers. Can you see him going home? Mama, you're not going to believe the story I'm about to tell you. I'm going to tell all of you something here that I haven't told you, that it gets better. When we all flow in this one accord, there's a corporate return. Now, a corporate return does not deal one plus one equals two. It goes one puts a thousand, two puts ten thousand to fly. Four puts a million to fly. It starts the quantum leap. It goes to the hundredth, the thousandth, the ten thousandth, the millionth power. What God is saying, what is behind this situation is not one and one is two. One and one is ten thousand. One and four is a million. And on it goes. And when they got into one mind and one accord that the corporate anointing was so great that you could not number it with a number that you could put on a wall because they haven't invented that number yet. What he's saying is that when you cast your bread upon the water that the multiplication of it is in such quantum leaps that so much is going to come back that everybody's going to have everything they're going to need. Your bills are going to be paid. You're going to get out of debt. You're going to bless the church. We're going to have more than we've ever had. But everybody's got to get in the flow. All right, I'm going to close with this. Because if anything ought to make anybody happy, this ought to do it. You know what one of the great, worst things that ever happened was when we got to understand something called credit. You know what credit is? Credit is the world's answer of you being robbed of your future for some present gain. Giving is God's plan that for the moment you think you've lost, but it is the key to your future. Credit says, now. God says, plant your seed. <laughs> Is anybody getting this? And then it's going to start coming back on every wave. Not try it and see if you like it. Systematic, every day, where you go to church, pay your tithe, give offerings, bless the work of God, keep the corporate anointing flowing, the needs are going to be met, the blessing comes on the whole household of faith, God gives us ideas, creative ideas, what to do. What not to do. I'm going to say something astounding. I'm preaching to tons of millionaires in this place, and you don't even know it. You have a hanky, baby? Anybody have a hanky? Thank you. Now, you understand this? 
Did you know the richest place in the world is not the oil fields of Saudi Arabia? It's not the diamond mines of South Africa. The richest place in South Bend, Indiana is a cemetery. Did you know that? Oh, you do now, honey. People that knew God are in the grave. They died broke. In debt, they had God ideas in them. Dreams that never were fulfilled. Visions that never came to pass. Hopes and aspirations that never materialized. God ideas were in them. Because you see, the seed of God is in you. And everything that you will ever need to become everything that God wants you to become has already been impregnated inside your spirit. It is in you and you're not waiting on God to do anything. All God is saying is that the map for prosperity and blessing and everything that you will ever need is in your hand and all it requires is obedience. 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 Do it, and God said, I will bless you and your seed, and your seed, seed, and your children, 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 and everything you touch, and your body, the baby in your body, if you're in the cow business, the dog business, the cat business, the parakeet business, everything you touch, God says, When you obey me, I just thought you would just be going, oh yeah, oh my, 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 my. But you see, when we walk in disobedience, I want to tell you something. I curse that old stinking theology that's come out in the past that said you're supposed to be poor and in debt. Well, if God were to bless me with money, I might backslide. That's stupid. <laughs> That's about the dumbest thing I ever heard. What would you want to backslide for? What for? Because He's a good God and He trusts you and he put his faith in you and he created you and it's up to you to put in your hands the means to perpetuate the world with the gospel and you mean he can't you mean he can't lay something in your hands and say you think you might hang on to this until I tell you where to give it <laughs> that's what I say honey You mean to tell me that the sinner is the one that's going to evangelize the world? I don't think so. And we try, and, and then you know what really gets... Brother Summerall, you know what really ticks me off? Say what, Dwight? I'll tell you what it is, Brother Summerall. It's when we get up and apologize for giving people an opportunity to have a breakthrough in their life by casting their bread upon the water, an opportunity to be blessed, and the preachers will get up and say, I apologize for making you give to God. That makes me so mad I could kick that speaker right there, but it would hurt my foot, and I'm not going to do it. When everything that we will ever need is connected to the seed, that seed is the key to my future and don't cut off my source. That seed is my relationship to God and don't cut off my source. Brother, everything that I need is locked up in my seed. And everything that I will ever need is already inside me. And I'm here to tell you, church, if we in the body of Christ, in the household of faith, will get this. Everything that I will ever need to get debt free and to bring corporate return on the body is locked up in just 10 percent. And I want to keep my fifty dollars with curse on it. I 
I'm going to tell you what the Holy Ghost said to me. And you will respect me for doing this tonight. You will respect me for saying it. But I have a word from the Lord for the body of Christ. And it's this. God said, I've told you about it once. I've told you twice. I'm not telling you anymore. The curses are going to start coming. The backlash is coming. If we don't start obeying God, every person that calls themselves born-again Christians had better start tithing to their church. The 80% being carried by 20% is not going to be tolerated by God anymore. And God said, if you will. I'll tell you something. It's connected to healings. It's connected to miracles. Well, I don't believe that. You can't buy miracles. That isn't what it says. It says you're cursed if you walk in disobedience. Deliberate disobedience brings the curse of God. And you never advance past your last act of disobedience. And until we come to grips with it. You know what? If I had a church... I wouldn't let anybody join my church that were not tithers. I'll let them attend. I'll let them come. But they won't be joining my church. You know why? You're putting a curse on this whole body. And you've got to stop it. And God is saying what's happening is that every need's going to be met if we'll all flow in the uh, corporate anointing. Every need. The, ch the bills are going to be paid. Your bills are going to be paid. You're going to have everything to need e to do everything you want to need. And God said the whole thing is tied up in just 10%. I want His blessing. I want His blessing. I want His blessing. I want everyone in this building that says, Dwight Thompson, I want the blessing of God. To get on your feet, get down here to the front as fast as you can and stand with me. And we're going to dedicate our life to the obedience of the will of God. <sighs> this was kind of a heavy duty thing, wasn't it? Huh? Was it? Thank you, sir, for saying that. There's something in the spirit realm the Lord had given me, and I had written it down. And it had to do with the greatest act of praise and adoration to God is to take that that you deem the most valuable and entrust it to Him. Now, I want to hasten to say this tonight, to pour, pour oil in the wounds of some that maybe it has wounded you. Because, see, I don't know you, so I don't know anything about anybody here. And I would think that probably this crowd tonight, since you're from everywhere, usually people that travel these distances to go to the house of God for this kind of an occasion, the percentage of that, of givers, will be extremely high here tonight. Do you understand that? So I'm aware of that. I'm probably aware tonight that probably you're looking at a 80 to 90 percent uh, tithe uh, faction here. Because most people that will drive distances to come to meetings like this truly support the work of God. But you understand, I have to say what I had to say because America was hearing it tonight. And we're either going to deal with this or we're not going to deal with it. We're either going to live all of our lives wondering what would have happened. But you see, the greatest indictment against the body of Christ, the believers, will be blatant acts of disobedience, where commands and instructions are given to violently, deliberately, blatantly, disregard, disobey, imposes the curse of God. But I want to make this statement to you tonight. It's God's will for every person here to be debt free. Now you're looking at a preacher that I've had my trials. I know what it is to go, go through hard times. I, I, I'm having, I've had those and I'm having those. I know what it is to have my faith tested. I know what it is 
one day to have like, thank God I'm, I'm days ahead. And then I know what it is to feel like I've fallen weeks and months behind. I, I've experienced all of that. But when you're in this kind of work, and Brother Summerall can attest to this in it, and it runs into the multiplied millions of dollars a year. And you're not doing it because there's any ego factor in it. It's too expensive for that. That's ridiculous. Anybody thinks that this is an ego, try it. It'll humble you, it'll humble you quick, honey. Get up every day of your life facing thirty and forty thousand dollars a day and see how it affects you. It affects you quick. So it's not you don't get up here and play games with anybody. So you know it's an act of faith. And so the searching in my own spirit for 1993 has been, oh God, I'm not interested in trying to have a bigger ministry or be a better preacher. I've got one goal in 93, and that is you concentrate on me. I want everything in my life clean and pure and holy before God. My thoughts, things that I have thought that I didn't realize I was. If I've gotten over here this much off, and yet years later I'm this much off, and I can't even see it. All the blind spots. When in my heart of hearts I think that I'm doing it right, to the best of my knowledge, I have never compromised this word in preaching to the best of my knowledge, but maybe I have and I don't know it. Maybe I have blind spots. Maybe whatever. I'm just saying, God, it's, it's everything. Get in there and clean me out. And I want to tell you something. When you start that kind of stuff, you're, you're going to feel about that big. And you think I'm doing it all right. Well, when he gets through with you, you're going to feel like a piece of cow dung. You're going to feel unholy. You're going to feel like you're just unworthy. And that's the process I'm in. And it tears you up and it eats you up. And, and, it, and it gets you low before God. And it's not. it doesn't take a day. It's taking weeks weeks and months and I'm not out of it yet see so I'm not up here tonight pointing at you saying you know this is for you that searchlight has been on me this year and it has been the most excruciating experience of my 31 years I have never shared this publicly but I know what Isaiah meant when he went into the presence of God and he said he felt like his lips were filthy. And I know what it is for 31 years that I've preached the gospel and I've come to this stage of my life. And I feel like there's so much crud and so many flaws and so many defects. But I know when the firing, burning process is over, I'm going to come out of it stronger and better and pure than I've ever been. And I said, God, don't let up. Don't stop. I've resisted it and, and I've fought it and I've resisted it and I've protected my, my little space. I, you, you, you catch yourself protecting your space, defending your position. I'm not bashing you. Please don't think I am. But I do know what God wants to do. If we will say, okay, God, I heard that man and I failed you and I'm not going to excuse it and I'm not going to alibi it. And you will never again say, I can't afford to pay tithe because, brother, I would be terrified to lay down at night thinking what can come on me just like that if I rob God. So I'm under the gun, you're under the gun, but when he gets through with us, it's going to be great.